principal, Chandra Hodgson, and our committee chair, Ian Gary. Humber's media services technicians, you can, who you can see working so hard in the back there behind the black curtain. The president's executive assistant and executive receptionist, Deborah Green and Ashley Lombardo. And of course, Humber's president, Chris Whitaker, without whose support the series would not be possible. It's especially nice that President Whit Whitaker was able to be with us today. I'd also like to take just a minute or two to announce the lineup of speakers that we'll have for the rest of the term. In addition to today's talk, we are looking forward to the following lectures. On Wednesday, March the 2nd, we will hear a talk from Mark Hennick, a board member for the Mental Health Commission of Canada. His talk is entitled, Getting to Know Thyself, Being an Everyday Advocate for Mental Health. That talk will be at the community room at the Lakeshore campus. To finish off our series for this academic year, on Tuesday, March 22nd, Dr. Lisa Kramer, a U of T professor specializing in behavioral finance and neuroeconomics, will deliver a lecture called Mind Over Money. That lecture will take place at the North, North Campus in this room in the seventh semester. If you'd like more information about these talks or any other upcoming lectures, please visit the PLS website. It's worth noting as well that most of our previous lectures are available uh, for viewing later on on the archive. Before I turn the floor over, please allow me to remind everyone here to please silence your cell phones. And as you listen to the lecture, don't forget to jot down questions because there will be a Q&A, a question and answer session after the talk. And when the time comes to ask your questions, and I certainly hope that you do have a few, we're going to ask you to ask the questions at that microphone that is uh, in the aisle way there. And that way, your question will be audible to people in the live stream and the archive. Of course, if you do need um, someone to bring the microphone to you, just let us know and we'll, we'll certainly do that. One more thing, we do have a little reception afterwards with refreshment. So if your schedule allows, I would definitely encourage you to stick around a bit afterwards. I would now like to turn the floor over to Tiana Cox, a second year student in the radio broadcasting program, and she will introduce our speaker today. Tiana? Thank you. Dr. Joe Schwartz is the director of McGill University's Office for Science and Society an organization dedicated to the promotion of critical thinking and the presentation of scientific information to educators, students, and the public. Dr. Schwartz earned his PhD in chemistry from McGill and has taught a variety of courses in its chemistry department and faculty of medicine. He has also worked in the chemistry departments of Dawson College and Vanier College. Dr. Schwartz has received numerous awards for teaching chemistry and interpreting science for the public. He was awarded the Montreal Medal, the Canadian Chemical Institute's Premier Prize, recognizing lifetime contributions to chemistry in Canada. He also won the American Chemical Society's prestigious Grady Stack Award for dem demystifying sorry, chemistry, the only non-American ever to do so. Dr. Schwartz is well known on Montreal radio as the host of the Dr. Joe Show, which is the longest running call-in radio program on the subject of science in Canadian history. In addition to all of this, he writes a regular column for the Montreal Gazette and is the author of 14 best-selling books, the most recent of which is entitled Monkeys, Myths, and Molecules. We are very excited to have him participate in our series today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joe Shorts. Thank you. Thank you. You have a very good radio voice. <laughs> well, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you guys uh, here today. And uh, let me start out with a, a true story. It was a dark and stormy night. It really was. And uh, there was a knock on my door. So I went to answer it. And standing there was a salesman. 
he looked kind of haggard. And I didn't really know what he wanted. It was raining, and he asked to come in. So I said, okay, fine. Can we sit down in your kitchen, he says. So I ushered him to the kitchen. We sit down, and he looks over at my water tap. And he says to me, sir, is this what you drink? So I sheepishly admitted, yes, this is exactly what, uh, what we drink. Not only that, we even give it to the dog with no problems at all. And then he looked at me with this sort of terrified expression on his face. He said, sir, tell me, do you know that there are chemicals in your water? Well, I still didn't know exactly where this was going, uh, but I thought it was a bit too early to suggest that he had knocked on the wrong door uh, because I could sniff something potentially delicious coming out of this. So I decided to kind of let him uh, go on. So I said, what do you mean chemicals in my water? Do you mean the H2O? He says, no, 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 that's not what I mean. What I mean are the invisible chemicals. You can't see them. <clears throat> I said, oh, yeah? So how do you know they're there? He says, because I can show you. Well, now things were getting interesting. Show me. So he digs into his uh, briefcase, and he takes out this device, which was a pair of electrodes, metal electrodes attached to a battery. And he plunged them out, down into a glass of water that we had drawn from my tap. And he says, watch. And he hooks up the battery. And within about 30 seconds, you start to see sort of a scum appear, a yellow scum. And a minute later, it looks decidedly terrible. And then he finally takes out the electrodes. And he picks up this glass and has me look into it. He says, you see, this is what you've been drinking, inferring that this guck uh, was composed of some nasty chemicals that apparently had been happily hiding in solution until they were scared out of it by the electric current that he passed through the water. Well, now I was catching on to what was going on here, and I knew that this was not coming from the water. I knew exactly what this was. I knew that this was really iron hydroxide, rust as you know it. And it was actually coming from the electro, through the process of electrolysis. But I still didn't quite know where this was heading. <clears throat> so I, I didn't really talk much about the explanation at, at this point. So I said, well, you know, um, and so what? So he digs into his uh, briefcase, and he takes out this water filter, which he then hooks up to my uh, tap, and says, uh, let's now take a sample of your water after it's passed through the filter. I say, okay. So we do that. We pass the water through, and we get the clear water. And he puts back his electrodes into the water, and nothing happens. It stays crystal clear. Well, pretty obvious demonstration. The tap water gives rise to the nasty, ugly yellow chemicals. The filtered water does not. Sign on the dotted line. Obviously, something good is going on, $250 for this filter. <clears throat> well, at this point, I thought that maybe it was time for a little chemistry lesson. So I said, OK, uh, let's take the water that you've just filtered. And let me add a few crystals of salt to it, just a little bit of salt. Say, so now you put back your electrodes. And he does, and the same thing happens. The scum forms. He is surprised by this because, of course, he can't quite conceive how the few grains of salt gave rise to all of these chemicals. Uh, so I started a little bit with a chemical explanation, but I, I saw it wasn't getting anywhere. I thought I needed to do something a little bit more dramatic. So I took this uh, scummy glass of water and I drank it because I knew that at most I was giving myself an iron supplement. And, uh, when I did that, his face turned roughly the color of the scum. He couldn't believe that anyone would do such a foolhardy thing. Uh, now he was prepped for the explanation, so I gave it a shot. So I said, do you remember being back in school and doing an experiment called electrolysis? Well, he didn't seem to remember having done that. So I said, well, let me tell you uh, about this neat little experiment. If you take some water and you put it into a contraption that has these two electrodes in it and you pass a current through there, what you will find is that the water breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen and you will see those being formed. If one of those electrodes happens to be iron, the oxygen reacts with the iron to form iron hydroxide or, or rust. I'm not sure that he really 
understood what was, uh, what was going on here. Uh, and then I shocked him again because I decided to buy one of his filters. Of course, not because I was convinced by this experiment, but because I had been looking to buy such a thing anyway because it does remove the chlorine taste from, from the water. So I bought that, and uh, this poor guy then uh, walked out of my house, and I watched as he you know, walked down the, uh, uh, the stairs and out to his, his car. He couldn't quite understand, I think, what I told him is that electrolysis requires that the water carry a current. And ordinary water does not carry a current. But if you put a little bit of dissolved crystals into it, like ionic matter, like salt, sodium chloride, then it can carry current. I, I think this flew above his head totally. So anyway, I watched as this poor, confused man walked out of my house and went to his car, opened his trunk to put in his briefcase, and closed the trunk. And he leaned back against the uh, car. And he reached into his pocket, and he lit up a smoke. Well, this poor guy uh, didn't realize that the chemicals found in that cigarette were far, far worse than anything that is ever found in, in water. It just never crossed his mind. Well, this is a question of risk evaluation. And everything in life comes down to that. Are there potentially some problems with our drinking water? Yes, depending where. I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard the story of what is happening now in Flint, Michigan with the lead pollution. These things happen, usually not because of technology, but because of the lack of using the technology uh, properly. So anyway, this was an interesting little experiment and an interesting little experience with really no earth-shaking outcome. However, the same demonstration can be used to defraud people. I'll give you an example of that. This is a foot bath, which is sold for about six to seven hundred dollars with claims of treating not your common cold, but treating diseases like arthritis and kidney problems and liver problems and food allergies. These are serious conditions. How is this done? Well, you buy this foot bath and you plunk your feet into it and you plug it into the wall and you wait about 30 seconds or so and you will see this come up here. According to the people who sell this, these are the toxins that are being removed from your body by this wonderful foot bath. Well, as you've guessed by now, what is going on here is exactly the same experiment as with my water filter salesman. The electrodes, one of which happens to be iron, are built into this gizmo. And because we sweat, your sweat has a certain ionic content, you get pretty good transmission of electricity through the water, and you get this scum forming. Six to seven hundred dollars. And they sell this to people who have some terrible diseases, including cancer, and make the claims that this will be a treatment for that. Well, this, of course, is uh, due to a lack of people understanding uh, the science behind it, and they are very easily taken in. But I'll tell you also something that is very interesting, is that I've had many occasions to talk to people who have done this, and I've explained to them the situation that this really is, is, is a very, very simple scientific experiment with, you know, with no real magic to it. And, uh, Nevertheless, they will insist that they feel better after they've done this. And I don't doubt that they do because um, the placebo effect is very strong. If you believe that something is going to do some good, very often it does. But of course, when you know some chemistry, you can unravel the mysteries of these kind of, of demonstrations. Uh, unfortunately, chemistry also has another side. We have an image problem. You bring up chemistry and people are scared. They're worried. They think that chemists are odd people who spend their life in the laboratory just thinking about what new cancer-causing additive to unleash on the unsuspecting public. Uh, they think that chemists are a completely different breed uh, altogether. Why do they think this? Because you go into a bookstore these days and you look in the science aisle, the chemistry aisle, what do you find? You find books like this how the hazardous chemistry of everyday things threatens our health, 
book upon book upon book about the terrible things that chemicals are doing. The word chemical being used as a synonym of poison or toxin. Chemists are depicted as being the devil incarnate who are stirring up trouble. Well, the truth is that chemistry really should be in the limelight because it is the central science. It is the thread that ties all the other sciences together. If you have an understanding of what molecules are and what they can and cannot do, you can take the magic out of science. And uh, I have a special appreciation for that because I originally got involved in this whole business of trying to demystify science for the public way back when I was in grade six, when I was invited to a birthday party and there was an entertainer there who was a magician. And uh, to us at that time, he looked like an accomplished pro. He wasn't. He was a teenager, wasn't very good. Uh, most of the tricks that uh, he did were eminently forgettable. Uh, but there was one trick that really captivated my, uh, my imagination, whereby he took three ropes and he pretended to kind of tie them together and uh, sprinkled what he called a magic chemical on the ropes, and all of a sudden the knots disappeared and he had one rope. It was a pretty impressive uh, demo. Uh, of course, at that time, I didn't know how it was done, but I was pretty sure that it wasn't done by magic or by chemistry. But I wondered why he had used those words. And uh, I went into the school library, and I took out a book on chemistry and took out a book on magic. And I've followed both of those ever since. And you might think that that's a very strange twosome to follow. Why? Because chemistry is a hard science rooted in the laws of nature whereas magic is ethereal, right? It doesn't have any rational explanation. What do magicians do? Uh, magicians counter the laws of nature. A magician can take a rope and hypnotize it. You want to see that? Yeah. All right. Let's do that. <clears throat> Here we go. We've made it defy gravity. Right? Now, a magician can do that. A scientist can't. If a scientist tried to do that, this is what would happen. Right? But a magician, of course, is just an actor on a stage playing the role of a magician. Everything he or she does is done by perfectly explicable scientific means. It's just that the audience, of course, is not privy to those means and hopefully never finds out because that's the value of you know, magic as a, as a form of entertainment. What's the relationship to chemistry? That chemistry can also look magical if you don't know the explanation. But of course, in, in science, we relish in revealing the explanation. That's where the beauty comes in. The magic disappears, and science appears in its place. But you know, the truth is that, that we haven't always had this image problem with chemistry. I mean, I remember b way back in the 1960s, going to New York World's Fair which was a great, a great experience, and the DuPont Pavilion, where they had dancing molecules, and they sang about, you know, better living through chemistry, which was the, the slogan that DuPont used in those days. Uh, they have given it. Now they've, you switch to DuPont, the science company. I mean, I've never forgiven them for giving up that slogan. I think it was a great slogan. I don't think they much care that I've never forgiven them. Uh, but it was very, very uh, descriptive. And of course, this was at the height of the, the space race with the, the Soviets. Science was, was riding a current of, of interest. Uh, if you admitted to being a chemist, you weren't looked down upon. You were not ostracized. You were, in fact, looked up to. But the truth is that even back then, those of us who were in chemistry, we knew that there were skeletons in our closet. We knew that not everything was being done properly. We knew that we weren't always releasing uh, our materials into the environment in the proper way. We were just doing a lot of dumping. Today, things are different. Today, the chemical industry has cleaned up its act. In fact, it has become the model industry with a theme. And this is a theme that I, I think is very, very important to remember because I know that many of you link the term chemical to toxin, poison, dangerous substance, because that's what you see in the lay press. The fact is that chemicals are just things. There are no good or bad chemicals. There are just uh, proper or dangerous ways to
to use them. And of course, our role as educators is to make sure that students learn how to use chemicals in a proper, respectful fashion. And that is our emphasis through my office at, at McGill, which is really a unique enterprise uh, created now 17 years ago uh, in order to, to make sure that the public has a good understanding of, of science. And the first thing I always tell people when I talk about uh, our efforts is that we have no, co no conflict of interest because we do not receive any kind of funding from any vested source. So it makes no difference to me or to my colleagues whether or not any chemical, be it bisphenol A or fluoride or anything else you can think of, is regulated or not. What makes a difference is that whatever decision is arrived at is arrived at based on proper scientific methodology and principles, not on emotion, not on hearsay, and not on, of course, the all-knowing they say. So anyway, the university said that uh, our job is not over the moment that our students graduate and pass out through our rotted gates at McGill into, into Montreal to become members of society, because no matter what, there are always questions to be asked. And if there is not a focal place where these questions can be directed, where you get unbiased answers, then people will end up listening to whoever is standing on top of the tallest soapbox yelling the loudest. And those, unfortunately, tend to be the quacks. You may not recognize them as quacks because these days they are cloaked in the garb of science. And they have very, very colorful stories to tell. And they are not always easy to overcome. But that is really our, our task. We try to demystify science. We try to make sure that people are up to date on what happens in the world of science. We, of course, hope to foster critical thinking and separate sense from nonsense. And if all of that works well, keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. <clears throat> now, when we first started this enterprise, I thought we needed a logo. And I suggested this one to the university. It's not that we're against eating meat, although in North America we probably eat too much of it. No, that's not what we're against. What we're against is this commodity, which is being piled higher and deeper, and it's getting to be harder and harder to dig out from uh, underneath it. It's everywhere. You go into a health food store, and you can purchase aerobic oxygen. <clears throat> I don't know where you would go to buy anaerobic oxygen, but never mind that. What you have in here is a smidgen of potassium chlorate, which in theory does release a small amount of, of oxygen. You're supposed to put a couple of drops of this into a glass of water, drink that, and it will make you live forever in a healthy way. This, of course, is total nonsense. First of all, we do not breathe through our gut. And second, the amount of oxygen in there would be absolutely trivial. With one breath, you take in more oxygen than what could be delivered from this silliness. Yet people buy it, and they will sing its praises. They will tell you that after they have pepped themselves up with aerobic oxygen, they feel all that much better. Who buys this kind of stuff? The same people who buy dehydrated water. Because these days, you can sell almost anything. And they do. Well, you know what? Aerobic oxygen actually makes sense when you compare it to homeopathic remedies. Homeopathy is the most absurd of all the pseudoscientific concepts out, out there. It is the notion that substances become more potent if you dilute them. The theory of homeopathy is that if you give a healthy person a substance in a high dose that will cause some kind of symptom, this substance will cure those symptoms in a sick person if you dilute it. Well, the extent of dilution is what is what makes homeopathy ridiculous. Uh, once you start diluting it to what homeopaths call a 12C dilution, which actually is not the most potent dilution that they do. They dilute it much, much more than that. But at, at so-called 12C, which means that you take your substance, so you dissolve it usually in alcohol, take a drop of that, put it into 99 drops of water, take a drop of that, put it into 99 drops of water, etc. Well, the time, by the time that you've done that 12 times, uh, you have no vestige of the original substance in there. But homeopaths dilute this even more. But at 12C, as you can see, there's not a single molecule left. Makes no scientific sense. Non-existent molecules do not cure disease. 
So how is it that this silliness has persisted for 200 years? Well, I think it is because of what amounts to probably the most powerful effect in medicine, and that is the placebo effect. Whether you're talking about homeopathy or whether you're talking about conventional drugs, the mind plays a very, very important role. 30 to 40 percent of the time, if you tell someone that they will get better because of some intervention, they will tell you that they feel better. But of course, feeling better is not the same thing as being better. Placebos do not cure the underlying disease, but they can impact on your perception of the symptoms. But the fact is that homeopathic solutions are nothing but water. That's all that they contain. And these days, homeopaths, of course, have a scientist breathing down their neck, telling them that, look, your solution cannot contain anything. How do you explain how it works? And they have to then resort to some uh, bizarre theories, telling you that when you took your original substance and diluted it and banged it into a leather pillow between each dilution, you somehow forced the water to have memory. And it is the memory of that original substance that has a curative effect. They never get down to explaining how this memory would achieve any kind of physiological activity. Uh, they just keep harping on this memory effect, which of course makes no sense whatsoever, especially when you start thinking about it and ask yourself the question, how come that that solution remembers only what the homeopath wants it to remember? Uh, why doesn't it remember the fact that it was uh, cruising through toilets at one time or that it was in the, the ocean at one time? In fact, ocean water should be the cure for everything in a homeopathic dilution because it has been in contact with absolutely everything. Well, of course, it is just silliness. But this silliness doesn't go away. In fact, the quacks are getting bigger and better at what they do and it's getting to be harder and harder to battle them. It's very, very tough to overturn their ideas. And they multiply. They're absolutely everywhere. Uh, they're outside our homes, they're inside our homes, and some of them can be quite vicious. Uh, in fact, they can be devilish in their arguments. Uh, one of the best examples are the anti-vaccine quacks. And uh, these are the people who suggest that vaccination is uh, created by the pharmaceutical industry to make money, and it actually undermines the public's health. They're aided and abetted by a fraudulent paper that was published uh, now uh, about 15 years ago in The Lancet, which is a prime British medical journal by Andrew Wakefield, who claimed to have some evidence of vaccines being linked to autism. Well, it turned out, of course, that his data was fraudulent and uh, basically he was kicked out of England, uh, lost his medical license, and now he's in the U.S. going around uh, uh, giving public lectures about how he's been made a scapegoat. This kind of conspiracy idea sells very well uh, south of the border. Uh, the anti-vaccination movement is a very dangerous one. Uh, we've already seen epidemics of measles since then because people are failing to vaccinate their children. Even if the autism theory were true, which it isn't, it would be totally irrelevant because the benefits so totally outweigh any of the detriments that there's just no question about it. With vaccination, we already wiped out smallpox. It doesn't exist in the world anymore. Polio, which used to be rampant in the Western world, is almost non-existent. Is it possible to have negative reactions to vaccines? Of course it is. Nothing in science is foolproof. It is always a question of risk versus benefit. But the quacks are out there, but we mustn't yield to them because we have a weapon to fight them. Oh, it's not a gun. The weapon that we have is the scientific literature. This is what we base our evidence on. We look at controlled trials. We look to see how good those trials are, what the experiment actually shows. We don't have any preconceived ideas. We go where the evidence leads. However, uh, we're not so open-minded that our brain falls out because there is something called scientific plausibility. We know a lot about science. We know the way that things work. And we can have a pretty good guess at whether or not something is plausible based on what we know about molecular structure, what we know about chemical reactions. So not every cockamamie theory has to be explored.
because we can have a pretty good idea of whether or not it, it can work. Unfortunately, these days, we are fighting uh, a current of scientific illiteracy. <clears throat> it is everywhere, and it's quite tragic. I'll give you an example. This is a brochure that was delivered through my mailbox, <clears throat> and it was an advertisement for underwear. Nothing wrong with this underwear. It's pretty good underwear, actually. It allows uh, moisture to pass through. Uh, but take a look at the advertising here. H2O, also known as sweat, is attracted to thermos skins like ants to a picnic. Our constant comfort process separates the H2 from the O, making evaporation take place much faster. They have the appropriate drawings along with it where you see the water molecule, the H2O. Of course, the graphic artist knew no chemistry at all because it shows a covalent bond between the two hydrogens, but never mind that. Uh, the water molecule, as you can see, breaks down into oxygen and hydrogen. <laughs> well, this is not ha what happens in evaporation. In evaporation, water just changes from a liquid state to a vapor state. It doesn't chemically decompose. This chemical decomposition would be electrolysis, like we talked about with my water filter salesman. <clears throat> if we could accomplish this with underwear, it would be a great breakthrough because hydrogen has a lot of energy associated with it. You may remember the Hindenburg exploding. It was full of hydrogen. Uh, or the Challenger disaster. That was a hydrogen explosion. If indeed all we needed to do to produce hydrogen was to wear the right kind of underwear uh, and collect the gas, we'd have a solution to the energy crisis. This, of course, is absurd. Uh, they are confusing the breaking apart of water molecules with, with evaporation. Now, that obviously went through some editors. It went through God knows how many eyes, you know, before it was made into a brochure. So as you can see, there's a lot of scientific illiteracy out there. <clears throat> well, I've been confronting this kind of scientific illiteracy uh, for a long time. Uh, on the radio is one of the ways that I've done that since 1980. Uh, and as was suggested, it is now the longest running radio show on, on uh, chemistry in the history of the world. Of course, it is also the only radio show on chemistry in the history of the world. So I, I can cherry pick data with the best of them. But it all started back in, in 1980, as is painfully evident. Uh, of course, the only reason it's evident is because you see the dial telephone in the picture. <clears throat> And to, to tell you the truth, I, I don't remember the very first question I was asked when I, I did the radio show, but I do remember the second question because it, it was a watershed event. I was, you know, young and kind of nervous, and I thought I heard the caller ask this remarkable query. And I didn't know what to, what to make of this, but, you know, all of a sudden you start to have these strange juxtapositions going through your mind. Uh, but it turned out that the caller also was kind of nervous and had been speaking very quickly and had forgotten a key word. And that key word was golf. Well, as I was to learn, golfers sometimes have the habit of picking up their golf ball, kissing it before putting it back down and whacking it. And this gentleman was concerned because he had heard about pesticides being used on golf courses, on, especially on the greens. And he wondered whether or not picking up the golf ball and touching it to his lips would be potentially a hazard because of the transfer of the pesticide residues. Now, it's not a totally ridiculous question. So we discussed it, and I sang to him the anthem of toxicology, which I've done many, many times since. Only the dose makes the poison. And we talked about this, and I said, look, you know, the, the chance that there's a, a harmful amount of pesticide being transferred to your lift like that is very, very small. But look, there are better things in life to go around kissing than golf balls. Give, give that a try. I don't know if he did or not. But what was interesting about this whole experience was that right from the first moment <clears throat> when the public heard that they were going to be speaking to a chemistry prof, this was the nature of the questions. And that surprised me. Because when I was first asked to do the show, I thought, you know, I'd get the questions like, you know, how do you make lipstick or, or you know, uh, how do you get rid of a blood stain on a shirt? The typical questions, you know, that you would think you'd ask of a chemist. 
Well, that did happen, but not very much. Most of the questions were, is it safe to do this? Or is this harmful or not? It was always this negativity associated with it. And that has happened you know, to, to today, not, not long ago. I had this question, is tripolyphosphate a chemical? Well, you see, as soon as I hear that question, I know where this conversation is going because I know what is really being asked. What is really being asked is whether or not this is dangerous because to most people, the word chemical is synonymous with poison or, or, or toxin. Chemists are these bad people who produce the chemicals which are undermining our, our health. Well, it turns out that in, in this case, the uh, caller had been reading the list of ingredients on a cleaning agent, a pretty good cleaning agent actually, and had come across uh, sodium tripolyphosphate and wanted to know if it was a chemical. So of course, uh, I go into my usual song and dance and tell them, look, everything in the world is made of, of chemicals. They're not good or bad. It all depends on how you use them. And I explain the reason that the phosphate is in there is because it ties up minerals in the water that would otherwise interfere with the action of the detergent. So it makes your product work better. And I think she was satisfied with that. Why? Because after all, if you expect to find chemicals somewhere, it's in cleaning agents. That's where they belong. She calls me back two weeks later, and I recognized her voice, although there was panic in it this time. Why? Because she had once again come across sodium tripolyphosphate, but this time on a different product. This time it was on a food. I suspect many of you recognize this food because it's a staple of, of diets. Uh, this is this miraculous concoction called Kraft Dinner. So she says to me, you know, I feed my son Kraft dinner every day, which apparently was not a problem. <laughs> so says, what is this polyphosphate, what is this cleaning agent doing in there? I said, look, this is actually a multi-talented chemical, and here it is performing a different function. It allows water absorption to be more effective by starch. Your macaroni in here is starch, and by putting some polyphosphate in there, uh, it cooks faster so that when your son starts clamoring for his daily allotment of Kraft dinner, you can deliver the goods more quickly. <clears throat> I'm not sure she was appeased by this. Chemicals were okay in cleaning agents, but she didn't want them in her food because I think she probably thought that, that you know, the Kraft company knew that eating their product is a messy business and had found some way to clean the kit from the inside out in order to improve sales. This is the kind of silliness that is out there. Where do they get these ideas? Well, they get them from reading books like this. Consumer's Dictionary of Food Additives by Ruth Winter. <clears throat> I don't know Ruth Winter, but she has no business writing such a book, which sounds like a potentially libelous statement, right? How do I dare make it? several reasons. One, we're not in the U.S. Uh, two, the chances that she's in this room, let's face it, are pretty slim. Uh, third, most important, I can back it up scientifically. Because if my phosphate-fearing friend had looked up in this book, what would she find? Cuticle softener, bubble bath, shampoo, all of that makes sense for a cleaning agent. But then looking a little bit further down, also in incendiary bombs and in tracer bullets. So now my phosphate-fearing friend would not only worry about her son uh, being cleaned inside out, but start worrying about him bursting into flames and disappearing, although not without a trace. So why does this lady have no business writing such a book? because she has made the most fundamental of all chemical errors here, confusing phosphorus with phosphate. Phosphorus is the element. Indeed, nasty stuff. You can make bombs with it. It can ignite. But once phosphorus joins with oxygen to form phosphate, that's a completely different story. This is tantamount to saying that you better worry about water exploding because it contains hydrogen. Well, water does contain hydrogen, but when it combines with oxygen, you have substance with completely different properties than hydrogen itself. So this is the kind of thing that people read. So it's not surprising that they get confused because you need to have a modicum of chemical understanding
to see the silliness in some of this stuff. And there, there's other reasons for the confusion because science seems to waffle back and forth, you know. One day we're told that butter kills you. Next day it's not butter, it's margin that kills you. We're told go out and eat as many fish as you can because fish are full of omega-3 fats and those are good. Why? Because they can reduce the risk of heart disease. If you feed them to pregnant women, they give birth to babies with higher IQs. So we're out there eating the omega-3 fish. Next thing you find out, that fish can harbor mercury and they harbor PCB. So you say, whoa, we can't eat, eat this. You know, science seems to go back and forth, you know. Uh, we're told, eat lots of, of corn because it contains lutein. Lutein is an antioxidant. Everyone thinks antioxidants are good. And then you find out that that corn may be genetically modified, and then people really start to worry, panic in the pantry, because GMOs, of course, have become the big uh, boogeyman, unjustifiably. Uh, all of this is enough to drive you to drink. And that's all right if you're drinking red wine, which supposedly flushes out the bad deposits from your uh, arteries and drinking the red wine until you turn the page in the next magazine or newspaper and find out that alcohol actually is carcinogenic. So you better watch how much alcohol you're drinking because it can increase the risk of, of breast cancer. So you better moderate the amount of booze that, that you drink. But you say, okay, you got to drink something. So what are you going to drink? You're going to drink tap water? Well, according to my water filter salesman, you're taking your life into your hands, of course, if, if you do that, especially because when you chlorinate the water, you form chemicals called trihalomethanes, which are known carcinogens. So you say, all right, I can't drink the, the tap water, but I'm not going to fork out money, $250 for, for a filter. I'm just going to buy the bottled stuff. But then you find out that the plastic Containers that are used that sit on top of your water cooler are made of polycarbonate, and polycarbonate leaches bisphenol A into the water. And bisphenol A is one of these chemicals that has been labeled an endocrine disruptor, uh, perhaps responsible for the earlier age of, of puberty in, in girls. So I said, all right, I can't have that water either. Maybe I better be drinking the single serving water bottles because that's not polycarbonate, that's something else. In fact, that's made of polyester with no bisphenol A there. But then you find out that to make that polyester, they use a catalyst called antimony trioxide. And antimony, if you may remember your high school chemistry, is in the same chemical family as arsenic. And that is worrisome because traces of that can be found in the water. So now you really begin to sweat things. But you can't sweat too much because then you have to use an antiperspirant. And antiperspirants have a preservative in them called parabens. And at least according to one now discredited study, that increases your risk of breast cancer. So you can't even make yourself more appealing to your fellow man or woman by using an antiperspirant. But you can say, okay, well, you don't really need that. You can just bathe or shower more often. What can be wrong with that? Turns out, plenty. Why? Because a study has shown that when you take a shower, there are 108 chemicals that are released from the water and from the plastic shower curtain into the air that you breathe. And if you listen to the alarmist, that shower curtain is just lurking in wait to do us in. So you can't take a shower either. What else can you do to make yourself more appealing? Well, perhaps you can at least color your fingernails. What can be wrong with that? Turns out, plenty. Because in order to make the lacquer conform to the nail, you have to plasticize it, you have to soften it, and they use a plasticizing agent called dibutyl phthalate. Now, there's a problem here too. Because if you take rodents and you feed them dibutyl phthalate and you isolate their male offspring and you measure the distance between their anus and their genitals, it turns out to be unusually short. As you can imagine, this causes commotion in the rodent community, uh, as well as in the human community, because we are exposed to these chemicals from nail polish and from other uh, cosmetic items. 
and all of a sudden you start to have images of your orifices merging into one, which is not an attractive uh, possibility. But what about the science behind such, such a study? <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have ever measured the distance between the genitalia and rectum of, of a rat. I have. Why? Because when I first saw this study, I thought, you know, this is, this is very interesting. How do you actually do that? How do you measure that? And how accurate are these measurements? So I, I went to one of my colleagues in the biology department who does the research with, with rats, and I asked if we could carry out some very simple experiments. We weren't going to harm his animals. All we were going to do was take them and measure their anogenital distance. And he said, okay. Uh, the, the rats were not enamored of this uh, process, but we did. We measured. We measured one after the other after the other, and I can tell you that this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and finally, we found that you really couldn't measure it to an accuracy of more than about 4%, meaning that you, tr you take the same rat and you do the same measurement twice, there's a margin of error, about 4%. Then I looked at the scientific paper. What was the plus or minus in their measurements? About 4%. And yet, this is what they based their conclusions on. Well, the margin of error just was not enough to come to that, that kind of conclusion. But anyway, you know, by the time that you hear all of these horrific things that these chemicals are doing to us, you say, OK, well, I'm just going to go back to bed and put a pill over my head because I don't want any of these risky things. But then you find out that the foam in that pillow is made with uh, polyurethane, which is releasing isocyanates into the air, and those are highly toxic. So you say, all right, well, I, I got to get out of this bed and go outside and breathe the fresh air and, and play out there. But then you uh, look up and you see the power lines, and you've heard stories about how power lines are responsible for leukemia and other problems. So you go back inside and sit down by your computer. Uh, and then one of the first things that comes up on your screen may be some alarmist nonsense about Wi-Fi and how that is doing us in and that you better start protecting yourself against electromagnetic radiation uh, because this is, of course, is, is highly toxic. So you can't play with any of this electronic stuff. You've got to go back to the old-fashioned things and uh, play with balloons. Well, we've got to burst that one, too because scientific studies have shown that the rubber there contains a contaminant called nitrosamine or a set of compounds called nitrosamines because of the accelerant that is used in the vulcanization process to, to make the rubber to say, well, I can't play with balloons either or with any other rubber product because they, they can have exactly the same problem. So by this time, you come to a conclusion. What is that conclusion? That if you're hungry, thirsty, smelly, unkempt, and bored, that's when you can look forward to a long life based on everything that I've just told you here. And everything I've told you is true, but it is taken out of context. Why? Because there's something I left out. I did not mention numbers. Everything in science revolves around numbers. We are always measuring things. We're comparing values. We're comparing data. So let's go back to the polyester bottles. What I told you about antimony being leached out from the plastic is absolutely true. We can detect it. We can find about three parts per billion, thanks to my colleagues, the analytical chemists, who now can even detect things down to parts per trillion. We find it. But just because it is there doesn't mean that it is causing harm. What we need to know is what that number means. We need to relate it to something. Well, luckily we can, because antimony as a contaminant in water has been well studied. And Health Canada and FDA in the US have, have uh, values that, that have been determined. And the ADI, the acceptable daily intake, is six parts per million, as determined by many, many experiments. That means that if every drop of water that you drink in your life for your 70-odd years were contaminated to the extent of six parts per million, there would be no effect. Well, we don't have six parts per million, which would have no effect. We have half of that. So it's insignificant, insignificant. So numbers matter. Why? Well, 500 years ago, 
Paracelsus, the great sage, philosopher, alchemist, told us only the dose makes the poison. And that is the cornerstone of toxicology. That is what we have to remember. Numbers matter. We have to know what exposure is. However, also to be realistic, uh, we have to realize that sometimes that dose can be very small, depending on what chemical we're talking about. You don't need very much lead to be poisoned. On the other hand, something like antimony, you would need more. So the amounts certainly do matter. Uh, not only in terms of toxicity, but also in terms of benefit. For example, if you have a headache, you know that aspirin works. Well, how much aspirin? If you take one tablet of aspirin and you lick it, your headache will not go away. If you take two tablets and swallow them, chances are your headache will go away. If you take a whole bottle of tablets and swallow them, you will go away. So is aspirin toxic or not? It depends, right? But again, I get back to this, this the problem that we have, that the word chemical has taken on this pejorative meaning, you know, of, of always being linked to nasty things, being linked to danger. People want a chemical-free life. They want chemical-free products. This is absurd. Nothing except a vacuum is chemical-free. If you're buying a product that's labeled chemical-free, you're not getting a good deal because you're getting nothing. Uh, in fact, even that isn't accurate in this case because that jar is full of chemicals. It's called air. And air has a lot of compounds in it. But people want to bring up their kids in a chemical-free way. They want them to play in chemical-free parks in order to try to reduce the risk. Because people are worried about risks. I mean, we all are. Life is all about trying to evaluate risks. But that's not an easy thing to do because our life is full of risks. You can be out for a casual walk. And terrible things can happen. Oh, don't go, oh, don't worry, we're, we're, we're nice people, we faked it, they're fine. <clears throat> but you know what? They're not the innocent little creatures that you think that they are. Because uh, no matter where you look, there's always some risk. You have to evaluate it relative to the benefits. And when you decide that there's a risk associated with some substance and it needs to be replaced, you have to make sure that the replacement is safer than the stuff that you are replacing. And we run into this issue today with this chemical that I mentioned before, bisphenol A, where there is some evidence that is potentially harmful. But the question is, are the replacements better? we actually know less about the replacements than we know about the old stuff. And sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil that you don't know. But if there is one message that you need to take away here today from this talk, it is the fact that the presence of a chemical does not equal the presence of a risk. Just because we can detect something doesn't mean that it is doing something. Furthermore, whether or not that substance was made by Mother Nature in a bush or by a chemist in a lab is irrelevant. The effect of a substance do not depend on its ancestry. And I mention this because in my many, 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 many years of being in this business, I think this is the single biggest myth that I have to fight. The idea that if something is natural, it is safe. If something is artificial or synthetic, it is dangerous. There is no such equation. You cannot tell anything about the safety of a substance or the risk of a substance by its ancestry. The only way that you can tell is by knowing its properties, knowing its molecular structure, and looking at the evidence of having studied it. Nature is not benign. Nature is very dangerous. Bacteria and viruses are natural. Mosquitoes are natural. Scorpion venom is natural. The botulin toxin is natural. Ricin, which is probably the most toxic substance we know, is produced by the castor bean. We spend most of our life trying to overcome the ravages of nature. Nature is not good to us. And very often we overcome the ravages of nature by using synthetic substances. Something else, though, to remember is that uh, 
high dose animal studies do not necessarily reflect on human exposure but we cannot do the requisite studies with humans you cannot expose humans to substances to see what will happen so we have to base a lot of our evidence on animal experiments and animals are not not necessarily you know perfect models all the time because the human is not a giant rat there are exceptions to that of course but by and large the human is not a giant rat so we cannot conclude that just because something is safe or indeed dangerous in an animal is safe or dangerous in a human but it's still the best model that we have given the fact that we cannot do the human uh, experiments I mean eventually it does have to come down to human experiments after you've gone through all of the animal studies because if you're talking about a drug well eventually you do have to study it in, in, in people and there are risks associated with that as well some of you may remember the story a few weeks ago where unfortunately six people in France were very very severely affected in a trial of a new drug that passed through all of the animal studies but it had a different effect in, uh, in humans. Something else to remember is that children are not small adults. They're a different species and a substance that may be totally innocuous in an adult may be quite dangerous in an infant or in a fetus when the nervous system is developing. So that has to be taken into account whenever we introduce a new substance into the environment. And also, you know, with animal studies, as I said, they're, they're really imperfect. And, and to, to um, underline just how imperf imperfect they are, you can take some very closely related animals and find very different effects. For example, dioxin, which is very much, very often talked about as the most toxic substance that exists. It may be so. It's never produced on purpose. It's always the byproduct of some industrial process. And it is extremely toxic if you're a guinea pig. However, if you're a hamster, you can practically dance in it. So here are two rodents, very, very closely related, and yet the effect is very, very different. To give you another example, chocolate. Imagine chocolate did not exist. I know it's a horrific thought, but imagine it didn't exist, and you had to test it. And imagine that, that a company that developed chocolate decided that, well, we're not going to test it on mice or rats. We're going to test it on something closer to us like the dog. Well, you know what? We would never have chocolate because there's a compound in chocolate called theobromine, which is toxic to dogs, not to humans. We can eat as much chocolate as we want. We do without any kind of problem. So there are all of these issues that have to be raised when you're talking about the relationship between toxicity, chemicals, and, you know, and, and health. And the fact is that science can never prove that there's no risk associated with something. We cannot prove a, a negative. And very often, this is what the activists try to put us in a position of, to, to, to prove a negative. You can't. I couldn't even prove to you that reindeer cannot fly. I, I don't think they can, and I suppose you don't think that they can. I couldn't prove it. I could take a reindeer, take it up to the top of this building and nudge it off and let's face it, if that animal ever in its life were motivated to fly, <laughs> that's the moment. We'd have a mess at the bottom. I could repeat it, I think with the same kind of results. What would we have proven? That those reindeer today, for some reason, could not or chose not to fly. You can't prove that reindeer can't fly. Maybe some can. Maybe there are eight. Give them the right date the right climactic conditions and the right urging, maybe they can fly. So science cannot prove a, a negative. And no matter what issue you look at in science, there always will be diversity of opinions. Whatever you look at, whether it's climate change, whether it's food additives, whether it's genetic organisms, there always will be contrary opinions but it doesn't mean that they hold equal weight. Just because you have more than one opinion doesn't mean that you pay the same attention to that. Unfortunately, sometimes, because of the way things are taught in journalism, this is the message the public gets, because journalism's are, journalist students are taught 
to make sure that they get both sides of a story. And they will write up the story, having interviewed an expert from one side, an expert from the other side. They write up the story, and it comes out as if the two experts have equal say or equal weight. Well, that is very, very rarely the case. Usually one of those experts has the majority of the scientific community behind him or her. The other one has a few rogue scientists. This is what we see now with, with climate change. In the scientific community, there's very little disagreement. I mean, climate change is real, it is happening. But of course, you have a lot of people who don't believe that, who, who come up with all kinds of, of uh, other reasons, you know, that, that we don't really have to worry about uh, this because it's all part of a natural cycle. Well, yes, we have had natural cycles of hot and cold. Of course, we've had the ice age, etc. But never before have we had a change in a shorter time as we have now. We've had the last 10 years being the hottest years on, on record. Uh, when you look back historically, temperatures have changed, but it's taken centuries in order to change, not a couple of, uh, of decades. Uh, so these opposing views do not necessarily carry you know, uh, equal weight, uh, and that is something certainly to be mindful of. But by carefully cherry-picking data, you can prove almost anything that you want to prove. This is a problem that we face these days, is there's just so much stuff published. Uh, so many journals, some very reputable ones, but many disreputable ones. But you can get your work into print if you just work hard at it. There are many so-called open access journals today where you can just pay and have anything uh, published. So you can cherry pick data. But of course, this is not what the real scientist does. A real scientist will not pick individual cherries, will shake the tree and collect all of the cherries and mash them together and then taste it to see just what the truth is. We rely on hard evidence. We don't rely on an anecdote. And the plural of anecdote is, is not data. And no matter what, it is impossible to predict all consequences of our action. Impossible. Uh, back in the 1930s, refrigerators used ammonia and sulfur dioxide as a refrigerant. If you had a leak from the refrigerator, it was a very risky business. I mean, you don't want to be inhaling ammonia or sulfur dioxide in your kitchen. Freons were introduced. They were a godsend. Inert materials, no risk to the health. Fridges lasted longer. You didn't have to worry about leaks. Who could have ever conceived back then that 50 years in the future, those freons would work their way up into the stratosphere and interfere with the ozone layer and increase the amount of ultraviolet light streaming through? Who could have ever predicted that? How would you even think of that? No, you couldn't. And same thing today. You cannot predict everything, but because we have pretty good understanding of the way that science works, we are much better at predicting things now than we used to be. There's another warning, I guess one would call it, and that is that correlation is not the same as causation. Just because there is a greater incidence of breast cancer in people who wear skirts, you cannot assume that it is the skirts that are causing the disease. Well, that, of course, is an absurdly obvious example, but there are many others. Because people will say that, that uh, we are seeing more disease today because we're using more glyphosate, which is a, a herbicide. Well, just because there's an association doesn't mean cause and effect. Indeed, we have a very, very strong association between autism and the sales of organic food. They have increased in parallel. No one in their right mind would suggest that eating organic food causes autism. You would have the same kind of relationship if you plotted increase in autism against increased cell phone use or increase in viewing flat screen TVs. They just happen to run together, but one has nothing to do with the other. We are getting better at what we do, at predicting. Today we emphasize what we call green chemistry, uh, where we emphasize using chemicals that we know are the safest and in, in the most reliable processes most efficient processes because of our understanding of science. And we're doing most things right. Uh, I mean, it turns out that the overall cancer rate is 
roughly steady. It's not increasing like the alarmists would tell us. Life expectancy is increasing. We're getting better at doing what we do, living longer and, and longer. Now, this, of course, does not mean that I'm a cheerleader for, for chemistry. Not, not at all. Chemistry and chemicals are just things. They don't make any decisions. Chemicals are not to be feared. They're not to be worshipped. They are to be understood. So it's not a question of, 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 of cheerleading, except for cheerleading for studying these things. But it is unfortunate uh, that we live in a society today where the chemical has become a dirty word, where you can go out and buy a chemistry set. And as you can see, it says on the label, no chemicals required. Well, how absurd is that to sell a chemistry set and say no chemicals required? But this is what the population wants, and they're willing to go out and si sign petitions to ban dihydrogen monoxide. Why? Because it is found in all tumors, because it is used to wash garage floors. Uh, it is uh, found in uh, blood. Well, of course, all we're talking about here is water, but we can get people to sign such ridiculous petitions. So we do have a problem in communicating. You may remember the game called telephone when you were young. You whisper something into one ear, and by the time it has gone through a few people and comes out the other end, the story has changed completely. Well, I leave you with one final little story here. One day on the radio, I was talking about uh, a red dye called cochineal red. It's used in... Uh, in various ways. It's used to uh, dye uh, maraschino cherries. It is used to dye strawberry ice cream. And I gave a little bit of history of this dye. It's extracted from the cochineal insect. These are tiny little insects that are raised on cacti. They're scraped off. They're squashed. It's actually only the female that produces the red color but you don't separate the females from the males. The males are sacrificed for the beauty of the female. So you isolate the red dye, and it is used in strawberry ice cream, and it is used in, in cherry ice cream. And I told this story, and I talked about the insects, and I said, uh, it is a small insect, smaller than a cockroach. I use that as an analogy, because it probably wasn't the best analogy to use. A couple of days later, I get a letter from a lady wanting me to explain because her neighbor would not believe that there are cockroaches in chocolate ice cream. Well, you see what happened here. I never talked about chocolate, but I guess that was her favorite ice cream. I did mention that this red wine was used in, in strawberry and, and cherry ice cream. Uh, and she heard dye, she heard the uh, insect, and she liked chocolate, and chocolate was brown, and cockroaches are brown, and I had used the word cockroach, and she put two and two together and got five and I uh, got all worried about uh, cockroaches in chocolate ice cream. I corrected it on the next show, of course, but you don't know whether or not it got through to the person who was worried. So what's the answer to all of this? Education, from early on. We've got to get kids thinking scientifically. We have to pursue the sciences through high school uh, because it is as important to be scientifically literate as it is to be literate in every other way. Our life today is, to a large extent, based on science. We need to understand it. And it isn't easy to understand, that's for sure. And I'm certainly happy to try to answer any questions that you have, but I will preface the remarks by, by saying that uh, science certainly does not have all the answers. There are some questions to which there are no answers at all. And we try. Science is, is very much like a race towards a finish line. But the finish line keeps always going just a little bit further away from you. But we do get closer and closer to it. So I'm a big proponent of, of education, which is you know, the reason that I have written books uh, for, for the public that try to explain these complex issues. And if you're interested in the kind of stuff that we do, we do have a website uh, and also Facebook. Everyone must Facebook and Twitter these days. Uh, so we have our official McGill Facebook page, but I also have my personal Facebook page. And uh, 
you can just find me there, just put my, my name in. And the reason for that is because on a personal Facebook page, of course, you can do things that you can't do on an official university site. For example, uh, I can't devote the appropriate words to this creature called the food babe uh, who beguiles people with her nonsense uh, on the web. I, I can't really use the appropriate terms on the official McGill a Facebook page, but I can on my own. Uh, so there, you know, you're much more liberty to tackle the, uh, the quacks. And if you're interested, uh, there also is an app that you can download for free. Uh, whether you have an iPhone or, or an Android, uh, you just go to this app store and search for uh, Office for Science and, and Society. So I, I, um, I started out with a, uh, a rope trick. Uh, and so I, I hope that with uh, what I've uh, done here for you today, I've been able to unravel some of the mysteries of science. And I will leave you with one final puzzle. Because, you know, we've, we've spent some time talking about critical thinking. So I want to give you an example and test you a little bit to see just how good you are at your critical thinking with my silly little device here, which has straight edges and hinges. And the question I pose here is how many geometric shapes we can make with this. Well, obviously, we can make a square. We can make a parallelogram. We can um, make a triangle. In fact, we can make two triangles. We can make a pentagon. Not bad. Now comes the question, can you make a circle? Well, you look at that and you say, of course not. How can you make a circle? You have straight edges and you have hinges. No way, circle. But before you dismiss something, you have to make sure that you've really thought it through. Because sometimes in science, it's necessary to think outside of the box, think in a different dimension, and find out that what may have looked impossible isn't. And you can actually take a square and make it into a circle. And that's the kind of message that we try to get through to our students. You've got to think. You have to think critically. Um, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But without investigating, you can't necessarily conclude that. Something may sound like quackery, may turn out not to be. We've had examples of that in the past. When uh, Barry Marshall, the Australian gastroenterologist, first suggested that uh, ulcers were caused by bacteria, helicobacter, scientific community said he must be crazy. We knew what caused ulcers. They were caused by excess acid in the stomach, by stress, eating the wrong foods, eating spicy foods. And then, of course, in a foolhardy way, he proved his point by consuming some bacteria <laughs> and developing a problem and curing himself with antibiotics. Now, around the world, ulcers are treated with antibiotics. First sounded silly, but scientific investigation proved that there was some substance to that. So anyway, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, certainly we're happy to try to answer them. Hi. Hi. One of the things that I find interesting in what you're talking about, and partly in what you do on the radio as well, is this rise of citainment, right? It's like everything seems, can, news can be entertaining, you know, any information. And science seems to be permeating all the airwaves, CNN, every article, every radio station. You know, there's whole channels like the Discovery Channel that are, you know, talking about science. Yet with all this talk and chatter, 
we're still no further ahead in understanding the truth. So my question to you is, why the increase in citainment? Is it to fill airwaves, perhaps? No, I, I think uh, to a large extent, though, you're preaching to the choir there. You're, you know, uh, people who watch the Discovery Channel are, are, are not the, the people who are into quackery. They're, they're people who already have an appreciation for, for science. Um, and there, I mean, there's, you know, I don't want to sort of overplay the scientific literacy. I mean, there are a lot of scientifically literate people out there too, you know, who are interested in Discovery Channel and, and things. Uh, the, the bigger problem that we have is, is how to, to get to the ones who really don't know. I mean, my experience has, has been that you can kind of divide the public into, in, into three. There, there are those who are very, very knowledgeable about science, and you don't have to worry about them because they'll figure out things for themselves anyway. Then there are those at the other extreme. And these are, you know, the, the dedicated alarmist activists who, who basically don't have very much scientific knowledge. And, you know, they're the ones who believe in the conspiracy theories. You know, we, we never landed on the moon. It was filmed on a back lot or, you know, 9-11 uh, was a CIA conspiracy and, you know, blew up the building from the inside. Uh, the uh, the white streaks that you see behind airplanes are chemicals that are being released in order to, to bend the minds of the, of the public and on all of these uh, UFO proponents. You can give up on these people. You are never going to reach them. I mean, I've learned that after being 40 years in that, in, in that business. Forget it. You know, they're, they're a lost cause. Luckily, they're, they're not a huge um, fraction, but they're significant. But then you have a, you know, a, a lot of people sort of in the middle who really would like to know but just don't have enough background to know who is, who is right. Those are the ones where you can, can influence. And there, you know, a little bit of entertainment makes the, the, the medicine go down. You know, uh, dry science doesn't sell very well. So I, I think, you know, with things like Discovery Channel, yes, to a large extent, it's, it's, it's the choir, but, but you, you're getting a, a few. But I, I mean, I wish I had the answer, you know. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the, the more science you teach early on, the greater the chance that, that they're going to retain the, uh, the interest, you know. I mean, um, curiosity is to science what a spark is to a flame. And if you take kids in, in elementary school and you create this element of curiosity, they will maintain it. And you don't, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, there's a lot of very simple things that you, you, you can do in elementary school to get them used to, to measuring things and think scientifically. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be more complicated than, than seeing, for example, you know, how many smarties facts do you have to open until you can predict what is going to be the composition of the next one. And it's always good when you can eat your experiment after. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, I've read some studies recently that out of the United States that have suggested that the placebo effect is actually getting stronger. Mm -hmm. to the point where it's hard yeah. to conduct a clinical trial because it's harder to tell the difference between the, uh, the effect of the actual drug and the effect of the placebo. Now, this is specific to the United States, and we haven't seen the same results in other places, but do you think that we are getting more susceptible to suggestion? And if so, why is that? Well, the placebo effect is one of the fascinating effects to, to, to study. To me, the most interesting aspect of placebo studies is that placebos work even when the people know that they're taking placebos. Mm -hmm. And we've done studies actually on, on that. I'm not sure what the explanation is, but you can tell someone, look, we're giving you this, there's absolutely nothing in it, or maybe it's a sugar pill, and we call it a placebo, but nevertheless, it's going to work for you. And it does. Now, I don't know what the thinking is, I suspect that what they think is that you're actually doing some kind of study where you're telling them that there's nothing in there, but there actually is. And, you know, I, I think that that may, that may be part of it. 
But there, I mean, there's many, many mysteries. But as you say, there have been studies about this that the placebo effect is increasing. It's not without controversy whether that is, is, is true or not. Uh, but I've looked at some of the studies, and I mean, they seem to be well, well done. You know, uh, uh, it's hard to come up with a rationale for why that, that should be the case. But uh, the placebo effect is very important, as is its uh, negative counterpart, which is the nocebo effect. And you know, that doesn't get talked about as much. But the same way that, that the power of suggestion can actually uh, produce benefits, it can have a negative effect. So for example, if, uh, if someone believes that, that uh, uh, artificial sweeteners, let's say aspartame, uh, can cause headaches, and they're told that artificial sweeteners cause headaches, they can get headaches from it, even though the evidence precludes that. Or, you know, if, if, if someone thinks that, um, well, actually, I tell you, this is an absolutely true story. Uh, there, there were a, a foursome of ladies who were playing golf on a golf course just out of Montreal last year. And they were out early in the morning, and the spray truck comes along, and they get sprayed. And they rush back into the clubhouse and accost the greenskeeper, you know, about you know, how horrible this is. And one of them complains that she got a rash. Uh, another one got a headache. The third one said she couldn't putt straight. And, <laughs> and I'm sure that you already guessed the bottom line of the story. There was a spray truck out. They were spraying water. But, but these ladies were so worried about pesticides, and they had read about you know, pesticides being sprayed on golf courses. They thought that's what they had been sprayed with and had the symptoms. Now, to them, those symptoms were as real as can be. It's just that they attribute it <laughs> to the wrong, uh, wrong cause. So uh, placebo effect is, is fascinating, complicated, and uh, uh, it's been with us uh, ever since we've been around. Uh, humans have been around, and uh, uh, Anton Mesmer really was the first person to basically make use of it, and we still retain the term mesmerism. He, he, he believed that uh, in 1700s that if you held on to a metal rod, a magnetized metal rod, it would draw disease out of your body. To us today, of course, it seems absurd. Back then, it wasn't so absurd. I mean, magnets are absolutely fascinating. I mean, you know, you, you put a piece of metal on one side of your hand, and you put a magnet on the other, and it will be attracted through your, your hand. So obviously, something is going through your hand. So you know it wasn't so unbelievable. And then, of course, he eventually figured that holding on to magnetized rod wasn't really necessary. Uh, he then said it was animal magnetism. It was healthy humans exuded this magnetism that could cure others. And after he was chased out of Vienna, he set up a clinic in, in Paris where he hired good-looking young men to cater to hypochondriac women. Uh, who would come there to be cured of diseases that they never had. And uh, so, you know, he, he talked about how the, the young men would exude the magnetism to cure them. Sometimes it wasn't enough. He said the ladies had to be taken to back rooms for further therapy. Then didn't, didn't elaborate on that. But, you know, back in the 1700s, already essentially studying the placebo effect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. That was um, certainly a... An extremely well, educational <laughs> and uh, uh, entertaining talk. So um, we thank you for your thank time. You. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that we do have a little reception now. Everybody's welcome to stay with refreshments, and you might be able to introduce yourself to our speaker and maybe ask a question in that venue. So. Um. <laughs> Oh, good. I didn't know you were going to be so funny. <laughs>